Coming up on Digital Music Trends 209 on the 19th of November 2014, YouTube Music Key unveiled, Beats Music could become part of iOS from early 2015, Vivo's CEO exits, Grace Note launches Entourage, Spotify partners with Uber, Bandcamp working on subscriptions, and we hear from the CEOs of Live One and Adrev, who are also guests on the show. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Linelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And you can find DMT pretty much everywhere. It's available on YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, Spreaker, Stitcher, Stitcher TuneIn Radio and uh, of course on iTunes as a podcast. And if you are on iOS 8, you can actually get the podcast app. The podcast app is embedded uh, on the new system so you can find the podcast uh, easier than ever really. And uh, uh, this week it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, Jimmy uh, Chamberlain, uh, the CEO of Live One and original drummer with the Smashing Pumpkins. So hi, Jimmy, and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Yeah, good. Good to be here. It's great to have you. And uh, it's fantastic to welcome back Brian Felsen, now the CEO of AdRev, uh, the first show you do in this capacity. And uh, uh, many of my listeners uh, will know him as the former president of City Baby. So hi, for Brian, and thanks for joining me once again. How's things? Howdy, doing really great. Great to be here. It's great, and uh, the video viewers will be, will see that I've added both the personal handle and the uh, company handle on the uh, video version of the show, so you can choose which one to follow. And uh, this week there were a bunch of news uh, that happened. Uh, of course, a uh, key piece of information is YouTube Music uh, uh, Key being announced, uh, but also literally like five minutes ago, uh, there was a Financial Times piece that uh, reporting that uh, Apple might uh, embed uh, Beats Music into the next version into iOS at some point uh, uh, as early as March. This is literally breaking news from about 20 minutes ago. And usually we miss mm. these on Wednesday, which is annoying because they come out about five hours after we record the show. So <laughs> it's quite frustrating when that happens. Uh, but first of all, I wanted to talk about, uh, and of course, we'll have the chance to talk about uh, your companies uh, in, in due course uh, during the show, which is both are really, really interesting uh, projects. And so First of all, I wanted to talk about uh, YouTube Music Key. Uh, the, uh, the service has been announced uh, finally. It was literally like five hours after we recorded the show last week. Uh, the company moved really fast after reportedly signing the deal with Merlin. And uh, uh, it was uh, it's announced as a, as a beta program, as many of uh, Google's uh, operations are. Uh, mm. it, you have to be invited to be able to take part. Uh, it will cost uh, $7.99 per month for a promotional period. Uh, the subscription will include access to Google Play Music and it will, of course, enable people to uh, uh, do things like uh, caching uh, videos uh, from uh, YouTube and then play them back uh, and uh, cache music and they will be able to access all of it without uh, advertising. Uh, so uh, a lot of interesting things to talk about uh, here. Uh, I don't think anybody has tried the service yet. Uh, any idea of you guys managed to give it, give it a go yet? No, I've not seen me. screenshots, but uh, but no, I've no, not, exactly. not seen the actual. Yeah, we're we're all action. talking blind. We've seen a bit of a video that YouTube released that was more of a teaser of the new service, and uh, YouTube is kind of kicking the tires of, of the service and doing a, a bit of a, a six month trial period. I don't really know when they're going to open it up, but apparently uh, the first beta users are going to get the service for free for the first six months. And uh, you know, there's there's a lot of conversations going uh, on around Spotify and uh, people trying to figure out whether the rates uh, the Spotify pay are going to be comparable to the rate that YouTube pays uh, or not. Uh, and uh, we've seen already potential stands off uh, uh, in uh, the, the realm of uh, pub public performance uh, um, with uh, Irving Adzoff uh, uh, stating that uh, his company Global Music Rights has not uh, had it, uh, made a deal with uh, YouTube Music to have their uh, 20,000 tracks on the service. So uh, let let's kick the news around a little bit. So uh, uh, Jimmy, what do you make of YouTube Music key in general? <coughs> Is this a good step that we've seen YouTube give people the opportunity to pay uh, or is there a, a, a worry here that you should might uh, eat the market uh, up you know again I think it's um well you know twofold I think uh, the first part of the answer is that you know anything that moves the for moves the needle forward economically for the music business specifically for the artists is good right um, Secondarily, though, this is just another example of the music business getting its launch handed to us uh, via the digital uh, medium. And really, you know, this is something, um, another example of the, the major labels kind of back in the truck into the dock as opposed to driving in forward and coming up with a revenue uh, economic, uh, an economic um, <clears throat> 
at least a business plan that made sense both holistically for them and the artists. And yeah. this whole this whole idea that you know YouTube or Beats or Spotify is going to figure it out and then they're going to divvy it up amongst the artists uh, without the artists having a place at the table is just kind of business as usual. And I think it just creates more kind of murk. Uh, amongst the digital, what is the business model? What does it look like? Who gets paid what? And you know, you see it, you see it um, penetrate. You know, even in, even as far as the Vivo deal, right. um, where you know the Vivo deal disintegrated. Um, you know, and there's there's kind of varied uh, theories as to why you know, you know Rio left or, or uh, you know the, the the deal got taken off the table. Yeah. Um, I think <clears throat> most uh, more than likely. It's probably just because the, the the labels didn't want anybody uh, to see what the inside of that deal looked like. Because yeah. essentially, Vivo is just a way for the labels to pay themselves for their own services um, without having to disclose or create any transparency within the construct of the business model. So again, you know, all these deals that are under the table, whether it be YouTube or now with Apple and Beats, which isn't a big surprise because I have a I have opinions about that as well. But again, it's like. There's no, there's to, to Bono's point at the Web Summit. Until there's transparency, nobody will really know what the value is, and yeah. you, you know you're never going to get you, unless you've got an insider on the advertising side or an, an insider on the licensing side or somebody uh, a label head or somebody at YouTube who's going to disclose. You're never really going to know truly what the numbers are, and if you're if you're going to be relying on Google Analytics, well, you know that's another story I can tell you about you know just the efficacy or the legitimacy of those types of numbers. Um, right you know, pursuant to any type of revenue. Right. Uh, Brian, uh, what's your take? And I, particularly, uh, I'd love to hear your th thoughts on the uh, on the Irving Azov story as well, because uh, uh, you guys also operate sort of in a rights management, uh, 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 as a rights management company that does all sorts of like royalty account uh, accounting uh, from the likes of YouTube. And uh, and so we'd love to hear your take on that and also on the potential fragmentation of rights of, of that, that may come from that. Well, you know, we're at, at AdRef, we really help protect uh, the rights of the copyright holders so that they can monetize, whether it be for the, uh, um, you know, their, their sound recording or for the publishing or for their audiovisual asset. The performing rights uh, money that's paid out on YouTube is very small to begin with. Yeah. Um, we take the position that people should leave their, uh, their assets up on YouTube to monetize it as much as possible, and we're here to help people do that. But if people like, you know, as off of, uh, Global Music Rights want to take down 20,000 of their top songs by their 46 top artists, we're here to help them do that as well. So, right. you know, it's, it's fine, and, you know, we're here to just help them protect the, uh, the rights holders. And, and of course, you know, here we're looking at a negotiating tactic, uh, presumably, of uh, Irving Azov that wants to get uh, a big chunk of money from YouTube in order to, to give permission for the tracks to be up, unless uh, there's anything else behind it or a, stand, you know, a statement of principle that he doesn't want the music on there. I mean, you know, principle is that none of these people are doctors without borders. They're here exactly, to, yeah. they're here to, uh, they're here to, uh, to make as much money as possible for their constituencies. He does a great job, and um, and w whatever he wants to do, we're here to help him out. Yeah, exactly. And so, uh, looking at uh, a more general point uh, is whether. Uh, the consumers that have been used to, to YouTube being a completely free medium where they could access whatever they wanted for free uh, are going to be willing or interested in paying money uh, towards the service. I mean, we've seen that the, the, the individual sus subscription channels that YouTube uh, tried out where people could pay a certain amount to subscribe to a special prem uh, you know, premier YouTube channel didn't really pan out. The, the reports from that were pretty dire. And so uh, do you think that the huge user base that YouTube has might convert some in some proportion to the service? So I think yes. Uh, I think in some proportion is very vague. I mean, it's yeah. going to be some proportion, right? <laughs> Somewhere between zero and and 100%. Um, sure. If you look at at the other services, conversion has been generally something from abysmal to bad. Uh, abysmal on the Pandora side, where I don't think that Pandora had a great value proposition for their premium service. It's like fewer ads. Well, yeah. okay, still great. Um, and then you've got people like Spotify, whose adoption isn't that huge to begin with. I mean, people are like, okay, well, Spotify's got 20 some odd million users, depending on how many you want to call active, and then, you know, X million uh, paid, and it's a, it's a small percentage. 
But it's, if you look at YouTube, YouTube's at a billion users. That's one-seventh of the planet. There has never been, uh, in history of human civilization, a discovery platform as great as YouTube. And YouTube has got the eyeballs, it's got an unprecedented ability to market, and it's got, um, it's got the video assets, and no other company has these. Yeah. So really, the question is, is will YouTube come up with good UI uh, and a good product uh, because they on occasion have botched that before. Um, and will they show continued interest in doing this? Uh, you know, they, 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 they win if it, if it gets adopted, but they win if it doesn't because they're, they're still making money off of ad, ad revenue and the, the ad revenue is really where the money is for them. So if Google wants it to win, if they want people to convert, they can drive people to convert. They, they have this, unlike many of the other services, has the eyeballs and the value proposition to work and I'm quite optimistic about it for that reason. Yeah, and Jimmy, we've been talking about the fact that there's, there's a lot of artists against the freemium services that are uh, essentially providing a free stream of music which is ad supported, but they don't put a limit to that. So like Spotify and Deezer, for example, you can be a free subscriber f for a, a long time before you decide to convert or uh, you know, with, without limits really. Uh, and so uh, what is your stance on that? And do you think that YouTube might face some challenges if uh, artists have the same issue with, with their service? <clears throat> yeah, again, I think, you know, to Brian's point, I mean, the, the, the stats around conversion have been, you know, somewhere around, you know, 1.4, I think, for, for Pandora and somewhere, you know, above that, depending on who you talk to on what day and which way the wind is blowing uh, on some of the other ones. Yeah. Um, you know, again, you know, YouTube as a, as a holistic uh, uh, content provider is not just dealing in music. I mean, they're dealing in other forms of content as well. So, you know, if you're selling advertising holistically across all of those verticals, you know, what's the, uh, how does that trickle down to music? Yeah, I think a billion users is, is, is certainly impressive. But again, I think when you start to bake in economics secondarily, it becomes, you know, the Groupon model where if I bought a cheeseburger for five bucks last week and now it costs ten dollars, how, how good does it taste and do I want to pay ten dollars or is it always going to be worth five dollars to me? And, you know, again, I mean, we saw it with Napster, we saw it with the MP3, we're seeing it again with streaming, just this consistent devaluing of the music as a, as a, as a, as a commodity. Um, just purely as a as a causation of you know the the people that own the music and and the license holders are not being aware of trends in <laughs> in digital. I mean to be you know completely frank. Um, again, I think you know Irving, you know who was you know my manager, uh, personal manager uh, for many years. Um, you know somebody I talk to um, <clears throat> not on a regular basis, but often enough. Um, I think he, he understands that eventually the money is going to come to the people who are creating the product. I think eventually Irving's been around for long enough, he's seen enough cycles to know that eventually it's going to revert back to the person that can write the hit song. And if that's Don Henley or Glenn Fry or somebody else he's got uh, under his wing, he's going to be left holding the bag and that bag's going to be full of money. And I think that's really what we're going to see you know, with, with Taylor. And certainly with what's going on with you two, I mean, there's going to be there's going to be a point uh, where record companies and the business that they represent becomes more and more anachronistic and becomes less of a less a, less usable by artists and more usable by catalog artists. I think artists that are that are uh, living in the current cultural modality will be able to do their own deals, will be able to represent themselves to streaming services like Spotify, and hopefully uh, engineer deals that are economically favorable for the people that are creating the content and not just rest on the shoulders of you know people who just happen to be smarter in the digital realm to kind of aggregate all this stuff together and deliver it to people. Absolutely and uh, you know uh, uh, when we ended the year last year in 2013 uh, saying that 2014 would be the year where we see streaming go mainstream we have, we have it has done so to some extent but really 2015 it really feels like the year at this point because we have uh, you know the, the YouTube music key service is going to come out a bit it's going to become open to everybody. Uh, Apple uh, as the Financial Times has just uh, reported uh, uh, is uh, considering although we never know with Apple really uh, is considering including the paid for beat service in an iOS software update that could happen as early as March according to people familiar with the situation it, it feels like uh, iTunes does need a shake up uh, it's gonna be interesting to see whether this is a US only move uh, and uh, if so I mean 
Uh, you guys are both in the US, you know, do you think that consumers are going to start getting confused as to how many off offers there are out there of different services coming from different providers, accessible on different devices? I mean, the Apple service might be, uh, at least at the beginning, it, it might be an iOS more uh, focused proposition. So uh, I, I don't know, how, how do you feel about that? I think, I think um, the pre whoever's going to sort this out are going to do it around curation. Um, they're not going to do it around content. Um, there's a real inability to curate an experience in and around music, whether it be on YouTube, Spotify, MOG, Beats, and there's no bigger music consumer than me. I, I create content, I consume content, I'm a huge advocate for both sides of it. Um, you know, I go on Spotify and, you know, I can name, you know, a thousand artists at any one time. I can't find anything to listen to. Nobody's curating a listening experience to me. You know, whether it's going to be Jimmy Iovine or, or somebody at Beats to, to kind of solve that, I think the next piece of this puzzle is going to be, I mean, let's face it, like in the 90s when when we were making music, you basically turned one knob and like OK Music came out of it. And you turned on one channel and like OK Music came out. And you know, 70% of it was stuff that, that I was like, but I liked and some of it was not, but at least it had some cultural significance to where I lived, what I ate, drank and slept, you know, people I talked to. There's nothing that does that now. So I think, you know, if, through social media or through platforms like 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 we build at Live One, our crowd serving platform, where people can come together through common interest and curate an experience that's musical and that's actually meaningful, I think that's when streaming starts to become mainstream. Right now, it's just a record store where everything's free. I mean, I feel like I remember walking into Tower Records, you know, after I made a certain amount of money and just kind of walking around not knowing what to buy. But when you got ten dollars in your pocket and you know you can only buy one record, it's a different experience. Experience. You go in there, you know what record you want to buy, and you come out and you listen to that record. So I really think you know that's if I were to bet on if I were to bet on uh, one person right now to kind of sort this out, it would probably be Jimmy uh, Ivy to to really look at curation and and somebody who's got integrity in the business or Irving or somebody like that or even Daniel uh, to some extent, um, but somebody who's really got uh, integrity, credibility in the space and knows how to deliver an experience to somebody. Yeah. Yeah, Brian. Uh, 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 who do you? Uh, I'm going to radically. I'm going to radically. I'm going to radically disagree on this one. Um, I think that I miss. I miss the days of curation. I miss the days of critics and gatekeepers. Believe it or not, whose opinions I would, to some degree, trust. To some degree, they'd overlap with my own. Um, and I would get to know their predilections and kind of say, okay, well, I know they're going to like this type of thing, so if they make this recommendation, I'm going to go with that, but I'm going to take that with a grain of salt. And I miss, like, okay, there'd be, like, independent labels like SST where I would just buy all their stuff and hope that, you know, that something was as good as the Who's Do album that I liked. But that doesn't... Uh, yeah, I, I don't trust Jimmy, and I don't trust the whole, I think that, that the whole notion of curation now, what are we stuck with? We're stuck with the wisdom of the crowds, with IMDB, uh, we're stuck with um, people at uh, very low paid or unpaid people at Pitchfork who don't know their music history, uh, all the great critics are being fired, but for me, you know, the experience of curation, of, uh, of discovery is very challenged now. I don't really care what my friends are listen, listening to because I don't share musical tastes with them. Uh, Jimmy it doesn't have my musical taste. He doesn't know that I'm going to like, um, you know, be, the Berg Opera Lulu or something like that and then next want to hear an EDM song. There's no moods thing or anything in the app that he's made that indicates that it could do anything remotely like a job that I want. And I'm more interested in actually self-curation, meaning I would like to be able to somehow follow people like critics like the, the, the Village Voices Paz and Jock poll. I'd like to be able to star in favorite uh, albums that I have already listened to through my entire life and my youth and be able to see them categorized like a virtual record shelf. Those type of things would be great, but you know, I, I just all attempts at curating on the web and in apps and with music and other content have so far fallen short and seem like just trying to harken back to the glory days of gatekeeping, and I just don't trust it. Right. No. Well, I think you know, I think that's a valid point, but I think what you're describing is, you know, and I'm not saying that you know Jimmy Iovine is going to deliver me the next Husker Du record because that's ridiculous, or even the Replacements record, or anything else that that hailed out of you know Minneapolis. But you know, I think um, you know what you're describing is a form of curation, whether it's self curated or somebody or some gatekeeper or some trusted source. I mean, for me, you know, my 
the only people I ever get recommendations for music for are just people that I trust as musicians. I mean, whether, you know, a guy played with Herbie Hancock, okay, tells me uh, to go listen to this jazz record, or Bob Mould, who I know, you know, Bob, and I know this is Jason Narducci and those guys, like, hey, go check out this record. Okay, well, that's great, you know, I mean, but, but really, like, for me to land on Spotify and to be delivered, you know, something that's completely ridiculous uh, or something that I just have no interest in listening in, that just tells me that people just aren't doing their job. And if I can go to Amazon and Amazon knows um, that I've got a boat and I like to fish and I've got two dogs and two cats and a bird and they start to offer me things that might make sense in the context of my life, then that's, that's, a, that's a type of curation that I think I'm missing from a music experience. Right. And, I, and, I, and granted, you know, Brian, nobody's going to nobody's going to guess, you know, that I'm listening to the soundtrack to Suspiria and then hand me, you know, the Cole Porter's greatest hits. Um, but again, you know, there is a there is somewhere where it makes sense in the, in the midst of kind of all this, like he said, she said, or, or what 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 somebody's going to deliver somebody. Yeah. It, it's it's just difficult because it's like even when I would love an artist like you gave the example of jazz artist and you know I'd love like you know when I love Nirvana and then all of a sudden you know Kurt Cobain would recommend all these bands and I would just hate the bands I'd be like okay I like yep. you but I don't like the schmucks around you and you know what I liked are the music critics but they're all losing their jobs and I you know I kind of still follow a bunch of people nobody nobody's recommended me more music than Greil Marcus for example or or Tom Erwin from um, from uh, All Music Guide. But it's, uh, sure. you know, they're not necessarily the ones curating. And I don't know that that's the thing. Even if that happens and somebody does a great job with curation, and I sure as hell hope they do, um, that's not going to be the thing, I think, that makes Apple win. You know, I don't see what Apple really has to add to the conversation. You know, YouTube's got the video. Spotify has got the scale um, and I, I, you know, there are, there are, you know, RDO came out with a better experience that Spotify, you know, shamelessly stole from. Uh, and I was an RDO user for a long time. Sure, that yeah. didn't ramp up. Rhapsody paid the most and they, they had the first mover and they didn't uh, get any kind of traction. So I don't really see what, what Apple has to add to the, to the conversation. I really don't. I think, I think what Apple has is they have 500 million people who have paid for music yeah. as a database. Um, you know, I think start there. I mean, oh, yeah. I think, you know, that that for, for a content creator is certainly attractive and certainly, you know, you see the U2 deal. I mean, you know, you Bono's, Bono's whole thing at the Web Summit was we didn't give our music away for free. Apple paid us a shitload of money for it and then they gave it away for free, <laughs> which I, mean, I thought was pretty brilliant. Absolutely. Um, but again, I mean, 500 people that 500 million people that have paid for music is is nothing to sneeze at, uh, uh, you know, against a billion people that have, you know, basically watched uh, a video of yeah. some music related. So, so, uh, so I uh, love uh, Apple products. I love Apple products, right? So, and I, and I would love for Apple to win. But then the question back to Andrea's question is. Do you think, would the fragmentation in the market confuse users? Does the fact that there was multiple players and room for multiple players uh, mean that streaming won't be adopted? Would it be necessary for there to be one or two dominant players for streaming to be adopted more wi widely? And I'm not sure that that's a necessary condition. I, I mean, think I, that there's room for all of them then. I think like, the one thing that Apple has for itself is the fact that there's hundreds of millions of people that, maybe not that many hundreds, but maybe a couple hundred million people that are still used to going to their, their Your Music uh, application on on the iPhone or, or the iPad or or the iPod Touch, and if you integrate a streaming service within that, and you say if you pay me like X amount a month, or if you even have a free trial for a month, and then you can search for music, and it, you know in, in your music you get all the music in the world, that's going to be a pretty interesting experience for people that haven't tried streaming services yet. Uh, if it just appears, you know. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be a VHS uh, Betamax uh, type of scenario. <laughs> Uh, with streaming, I think you know. I think uh, Brian's right. I think there's room enough for everybody. And I think, but again, I think it's going to be, um, you know, how do you want to consume your music? I mean, I consume my music at home in a lot of different ways. I have, you know, a Macintosh stereo that I play vinyl only on, and that's a one experience that I love to do. And I sit down and listen to a great record for 20 minutes and just kind of veg out. And uh, but again, it's like. 
uh, another part of my listening is I have Sonos in my kitchen, so it's like you know, then I'm playing you know Spotify or an MP3 through my Sonos, and it becomes about convenience. Or do I want to take that and listen to a continuation of that in my car as I yeah. drive somewhere? I mean, there's a there's the portability aspect of it. So I think you know, music is going to continue to be compartmentalized in in, in regard to the consumer, and really, it's going to be you know, what experience do you want, and how important is it for you for it to be portable versus the fidelity versus the amount of the amount of content available. Yeah. And talking I, about I find it incredibly intriguing that not one of the scenarios that you gave has involved social listening and I find that to be very telling because I thoroughly agree with you. There's not one application where I give a fig about social listening. Right. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a, great, trying, that's a great point. That's a great point. But I, I would say that a lot of the stuff that I listen to, uh, in fact, I think, you know, 50 to 60 percent of the new stuff that I listen to comes through some type of recommendation. And I'm I'm just not good at fun. And I'm, that's why, you know, there's some people that are great DJs and there's some people that, not, that aren't. And even though I may have the same record collection as somebody who loves to play records, I'm not going to play them in that specific order that's actually going to please a crowd. So I rely heavily on, you know, the, like the David fricks of the world or the Shanahan's of the world to tell me like hey I saw this band you should go check them out because I frankly I mean I'm running a company too Brian I don't have I don't have a ton of a ton of time to just go sit and poke around like I used to or yeah. you know thumb through records does, um, yeah. like I used to so I'm pretty heavily relying on uh, even my employees who are a lot of them are in their 20s like hey what should I be listening to today or yeah. my kids I mean I've got you know a 12 year old daughter who's got she's got Spotify she's on Pandora but she also has a record collection and so it's interesting for her because she has access to my records, you know, what she gravitates to. When she plays vinyl, I mean, she's listening to Bowie or Curtis Mayfield or whatever she may have grabbed out of my pile. But when she listens on uh, Spotify or Pandora, she's listening to Imagine Dragons or something that's, you know, that's that's relevant now. So, yeah. you know, is it... Is it is it is it um, you know is it uh, is there the tether is it the tethering a uh, causation of digital to digital or is it this you know records are supposed to be analog they're consumed a certain way certainly in my house there's a bit of a disconnect there there and and to talking about formats you know you're, you're talking about portability and one of the interesting stories of this week was also the launch of uh, uh, Grace Notes uh, Entourage platform so uh, what Grace Note did and I feel I felt like a few of the headlines were sort of misrepresenting what what exactly the the service was doing but it, essentially it's it's a back end uh, service that Grace Note would provide to the car makers that would allow them to essentially pour, pull information uh, for specific artists and tracks and no matter where the uh, uh, song comes from. So whether it's coming from your uh, you know, Pandora, from your Spotify, from your own uh, MP3s on the car, uh, from an aux cable even. So I guess they are, they're using some sort of fingerprinting uh, technology as well for that. And uh, it displays it uh, uh, homogeneously in the dashboard. So, I mean, I, I took a trip in the States uh, in October and, and I had a rental car and uh, it was a nice rental car as well uh, just because we were going to some pretty remote places so I tried to get something a bit better than the usual total economy one and <laughs> and uh, and we ended up uh, uh, listening to a lot of uh, country music that I didn't know anything about and different radios have different ways of playing it then we switched to Spotify and the, the information wasn't coming up at all uh, then I switched to Bluetooth and some information was coming up into the car and some information wasn't uh, and so I, I I guess there is some need for homoge homo homogeneity. I uh, can't, can't speak today uh, on the on the uh, on the car. But do you do you guys feel like it's a big issue that is uh, perhaps preventing people from having the experience they would like on the dashboard at the moment, uh, uh, Brian? I think it's it's. I think this is a stupid sideshow that uh, that is something that is really really impressive to the shareholders and investors of these companies. I mean, Pandora has integration and and all these people have integration and this is all great. I mean, there is no there is nothing that has ever integrated with a dashboard of any motor vehicle that I have personally been in that has worked well or been upgradable. Not one nav device, not one Pandora <laughs> integration, not nothing. If I want good information displayed on a screen while I'm driving, it's going to be an iPhone or an iPad mini or some device which is going to be clutched into being clipped onto the CD player or onto the air vent of the thing and it's going to be played in through Bluetooth and stop. Right. Jimmy, you got a quite, quite a bit of traffic out in Chicago as well. 
Yeah, sorry. We live in a high crime area here. Um, <laughs> no, uh, it's actually really cold. There's been a there's been a kind of a a, a, a rash of uh, fires because uh, of the first uh, couple oh, wow. of cold days here. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I'm with Brian. I mean, I think you know, again, I think it's 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 niche. What do people want? Uh, how you know? How comprehensive do they want? How much comprehensive information do they want around you know the specific artist? I mean, I mean, look, you know, music has become you know, music used to be you know kind of a singular experience. Now, now music, since it's become digital, is competing for a lot of the same real estate that Twitter competes with, that that the things on your phone, apps on your phone. I mean. Yeah, I think there's enough information out there. I think people just generally want to hear good music. And that's, you know, let's start there. I mean, I always, you know, I just did this thing at San Francisco Web and Tech Summit where it's like yeah. the whole panel was on, you know, social media plans around music. And there's all these musicians asking questions about, you know, hey, you know, should I should I do meet and greets before my show or should I stay and meet the crowd afterwards right. or how important is it for me to get emails and it's like this dialogue just went on for like 30 minutes about, you know, you've got to build in social media to your economic model and I just I just said, you know what? Just go in your van and write a better song, right? Because that's all people want. They just want to hear a great song. Once you write the great song, all that other stuff will sort itself out magically. All those social media, it all, it'll all figure <laughs> itself out. But it one, you know, one doesn't come before the other. So. Yeah, no, that, that's for sure. I mean, if if you don't have the one, then the other doesn't happen at all. So, um, and uh, Brian, uh, w uh, quickly, I wanted to ask you about uh, Adrev. Uh, uh, you know, you mentioned it uh, briefly before, but it's one of those companies that people find hard to. Fine. I mean, my, even m myself, you know, if I had to give you like a one minute uh, sort of description of what our draft does, I'd find it pretty difficult. So can you enlighten us a little bit and perhaps uh, uh, so that people that are listening can, can uh, head over there and, and check it out? Sure. Uh, AdRev is the, the leading company in uh, the world, the independent company that is, that does content ID administration and monetization on YouTube as well as elsewhere, but primarily YouTube. What we do is we help uh, if we help the rights holders uh, make money off of usages of their music which are not authorized. If you've right. written a song or performed a song and somebody else is using it and the entire YouTube ecosystem will detect it and then we can either issue a takedown or much better uh, monetize it by telling Google, hey, place an ad on that and directing the advertising revenue back to the rights holder. Uh, in addition, we also have a multi-channel network with some of the biggest YouTube stars on there as well and that helps the video creators, not, not necessarily the, the publishers or the writers right. or the, the, the sound recording owners, but the video creators make money on YouTube as well. Absolutely, and I, I've heard a couple of people that mis mistook actually Android for a, a pure multi-channel network and uh, I had to explain that that wasn't actually the case. So I guess that's a common misconception out there uh, for people that haven't looked into the company too much. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Could be. <laughs> uh, but, but but there's there's more money uh, there's there's more money on uh, believe it or not on the off channel usages in many cases than there are on the channel. Absolutely, I mean, yeah. yeah. A lot of times people are making money who've never made a video in their lives because somebody's using their music or their composition, and I think that's nice. a beautiful thing. That's beautiful, uh, Jimmy. Uh, as far as Live One is concerned, uh, I haven't had you on the show before, so uh, give us a little bit of an outline of, of what the company does and and uh, what people should should know about it. Sure. So Live One, uh, we have our, our core product is called Crowdsurfing. It's a social media technology that attaches to live stream video and creates a social ecosystem that bolts on, allows people to communicate uh, much like they would at an analog event, much like they would in the physical space. Um, they can click on thumbnail profiles, do social discovery. They can create a conversation. Um, they can bring groups of people together, uh, congeal uh, in and around content. And really what we look to do is just create an environment that takes some of the stark uh, the stark reality out of uh, online content consumption and really yeah. create an online digital venue that starts to mimic some of the uh, some of the actions that people would do in the physical space and then you know we can do things for for, for, for content creators like uh, e-commerce uh, additive content in the widget we can do non disruptive video we do full screen overlay um, we provide data sets at the end of the event um, and an ability to second and third uh, connect with those people so you know right now uh, you know, music is uh, probably you know a small, smaller part of our business. We do a lot of things with uh, CBS Sports, NBC, uh, Red Bull. Um, you know, 
there's some other big uh, big platforms that we're working with, but we also do you know the the pitchforks and the ACLs uh, uh, of the world where you know we're just that business for us where it's you know a lot of the same uh, a lot of the same uh, customization and setup uh, for a kind of one and done um, makes less sense than a kind of a full on SEC football campaign or, or something that, that that goes on you know 40 50 events per week. So yeah, so we're what we look you know music is interesting and I think. For me, when I watch, you know, videos on YouTube, um, you know, having watched, uh, having stood, you know, both next to every inflatable beer can in the world, uh, played every major festival, and probably, you know, am a huge music consumer, I just, you know, for me, watching a YouTube video of even a great live performance, like I was watching some Depeche Mode uh, thing the other day, it was from Germany, just a fan, I'm a huge fan, and I, I'm a huge fan of Depeche Mode, so is my daughter, I watched a YouTube video, I know that the concert uh, of the video was absolutely fantastic, I've heard, uh, reports but it's like that's never going to motivate me to go buy a Depeche Mode t-shirt or that's never going to drive out economics outside of a uh, advertising revenue so what we look at is like if we can create an audience in and around that in a way that you know provides communication tools in a way that legitimizes the content much in the way that Brian and I would say that you know Bob Mole is a great had a knock knocked it out of the park at a performance now I'm going to go buy a hat or a t-shirt you know we look at that type of scenario as like that's those are the types of equations we try to solve for. That's awesome. This is mostly as a causation of my own kind of yeah. pumpkins tried live streaming with MySpace back in 2005 <laughs> and a million people showed up and nothing happened. Right. I mean, and we thought, you know, hey, a million people just watched this great concert from Madrid. We spent a quarter million dollars on the production. <laughs> uh, we Ouch. migrated it all online. You know, a million people showed up and watched it. And the next day, there was absolutely no economics that took place. You know, what was the difference between that and say when we do a Letterman or an SNL where you could see a real uptick in sales the next day and really we distilled it down to the fact that, you know, broadcast television consumption is done in an environment of our creation over 40, 50 years. Live stream content still has a ways to go as far as how people are going to consume it and, and what, what type of economic decisions we can motivate them to make post that content consumption. Absolutely. And I, I have like a, an interest, I have some thoughts around live streaming of music. I don't know if you guys, uh, uh, you know, agree or disagree, but I, I, was, I always thought that there's a bit of a disconnect between uh, music and sport in the sense that you know somebody is unlikely to want to live stream an entire tour of a band because it's going to be relatively similar date on date and so you might want to create an event that you know you might want to do one or two or three or four live streams but uh, really at the end of the day people are looking for an event that is special and something that they can connect to at some level while sport is dif different in every single game because of course the, the result is different the other team is different and so that that creates a, a much more dy uh, d dynamism when it comes to uh, actually getting people to watch every single live stream that you produce so so how do you tackle that problem do, do you think that problem exists yeah I do I think you're absolutely right I think you can watch you know 10 performances of the same song by the same artist in 10 different venues and you'd never know where or what you were watching um, you know contrary to that if you watch Chelsea versus Man U you know you're going to know exactly what you're watching and you're going to want to watch it as it's happening because it's a must see event you're not yeah. going to be you're not going to be you know the content doesn't become irrelevant if you hear the Depeche Mode played a certain song at a certain concert you're still going to go and be able to watch that as a as a VOD type of experience but you're not going to want to see the score to that game and then you're not going to go watch it secondarily at least yeah. maybe the rabid fan would but I certainly once you know the Olympics is a great example of that is like I couldn't you know even look at my phone if I wanted to watch the Olympics because ultimately I'd get some news alert that said, you know, hey, so-and-so just won the gold, and I'd be like, oh, well, I guess I'm not going to watch it tonight. You know, so sports for us is a big, you know, it's a must-see, you've got to watch it live. Absolutely. And uh, moving on to uh, Bandcamp. So uh, Bandcamp is a service that has been uh, uh, hailed uh, by many of my guests as uh, their preferred uh, method of selling their music online. And uh, a lot of people really love that, that company. And, uh, and now The Guardian uh, has reported that uh, the company is working on a subscription service that will let fans pay for a year's worth of music uh, from their favorite artists. Of course, the price points are going to be different uh, in, depending on what the artist promises to uh, give the fans. It might be just one album, maybe it may be a bunch of tracks or outtakes or demos or anything like that and uh, so you know the price points are going to be uh, uh, varying uh, because of that and also because of the st statue statue of the uh, artist in question um, 
we have seen a few companies that have come in with subscriptions you know Patreon is doing that but uh, uh, there aren't that many art, uh, music artists on there it's a lot of podcasters a lot of video, video producers uh, uh, you know I, I was talking to uh, Benji from Pledge and he was saying that he didn't feel like uh, uh, they were going to do anything around subscriptions because he didn't feel like it applied to uh, the kind of thing that they do and, and to perhaps even to music in general so uh, how do you feel about subscriptions do you think that artists can deliver on, on a you know $30 a year uh, a plan and, and how might that look like uh, Brian uh, uh, your thoughts are given that you were at City Baby for quite a long time I love what Bandcamp is doing in fact I love a lot of what Bandcamp does a lot of the time I think that they uh, they re release products that help uh, artists make money in in music and anything that can help artists make money is a good thing um, I think that as far as subscriptions go it could. It, I think it's it's destined to be a niche product. I right. think that it would appeal not only niche for the super fan, but uh, because look, a fan could spend nine ninety nine and get for a month the entire history of Western recorded music, or they could spend you know thirty dollars and support one band. And supporting yeah. a band is good. I think everybody should should you know save the whales and support your bands. But uh, it, it, you would not only need the super fan to do that. And you would not only need them to do that on Bandcamp's platform, but you would also need an artist that's releasing a ton of content. Yeah. And, you know, a, you might be an EDM artist that drops a single every month, but, you know, a lot of artists would release an album every couple of years, yeah. uh, and it really, in that case, wouldn't necessarily pertain to them. Yeah. Jimmy, as, as an artist, well, what's your take? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that creates parameters that an artist is not going to be comfortable with. I think, um, you know, those types of things always look good on paper. Um, but generally, you know, when the when the piper comes to calling and the music is due and you haven't written the song, I mean, it creates all kinds of problems. Um, <laughs> So again, you know, I think it. I think I think it is niche. I mean, you know, we we look at you know fans, super fans, you know, people that'll buy all of our stuff. But that you know that comes later. I don't think um, you know new bands that are that are having success on Bandcamp really want to to push it in that way. I think I think there's a way to grow uh, the business in other ways, uh, in other peripheral uh, economic ways uh, besides subscription. Um, I think. Um, you know, music has become, you know, the kind of de facto business card for the live show, you know, much to yeah. the chagrin of, of Irving and company. But, um, you know, I just don't I just don't see me uh, ever subscribing uh, to anything. You know, I'm, I'm kind of a wait and see, deliver me the album in the normal way and I'll go listen to it. And let's call that a relationship. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, looking at uh, uh, one of the other interesting news that happened this week was that BitTorrent finally opened up their bundles to everybody. So, uh, you know, this uh, is 18 months after the introduction of the first uh, alpha version uh, with a handful of artists and, and other uh, types of uh, creators. Uh, the bundle, uh, as we've talked about at length on the show, allows you to download a BitTorrent file that essentially contains a uh, half of it is, is open, so it's free to access. And the other part is behind uh, some sort of wall. So that, uh, that at the beginning of the service, that was a wall of information so you have to provide your email address or some other data to to uh, to the artist or to the uh, creator in order to access that bundle and in, uh, in the in the recent months uh, um, BitTorrent has actually started allowing people to pay to access that uh, second part of information and obviously uh, Tom York's uh, latest album Modern Boxes that was released uh, uh, through the BitTorrent bundles was a, a big success in terms of downloads it got 4.4 million downloads to date <coughs> but there's no uh, data released as to how many people actually decided to pay for uh, access accessing the entire album so a uh, bit of a question mark there on how much uh, actually was sold uh, so uh, users are going to be able to unlock the per performance whenever they want uh, but there is always a free component of content there and BitTorrent only charges 10% which is way less than what iTunes charges and a lot of other services too so uh, uh, thoughts here you know uh, do you think this is going to catch on the one thing that I, I, I wonder is that people are going to have to download the BitTorrent application to download the bundle and that might be a bit of a barrier because I don't know it, it just seems like the, the normal consumer would find it hard to go and do the trouble of downloading this application just to get the bundle it's, that their artists are giving out. It's not, it's not the only barrier. Yes there's the friction of downloading the application but above all there's the friction of people buy stuff where people buy stuff. 
people buy stuff from Amazon, yeah. people will consume streaming on Spotify, but they're not going to buy downloads on Spotify. They're not, it's just, you look at the, it's just, that's, people's behavior is what their behavior is. They, they go to the watering holes that they go to for the purposes they go to, and people go to BitTorrent <laughs> to steal shit. Period. So if, if you're going, I mean, so here you've got BitTorrent. No, I mean, okay, yeah, there's scientific researchers that can disseminate information in an efficient way. Shut up. It's it's to steal stuff. And the fact of it is, is that to go to BitTorrent and then pay. I mean, and and I'm I'm really sick of Tom York being held out as an exemplar of what's possible because Tom York could release an album on my right butt cheek and have it be a success. I mean, these are like, okay, yeah, his pay as you go model worked. Well, that's yeah. great. And Taylor. Swift withheld and sold 1.2 million copies. That's fantastic. They're outliers, and outliers are outliers because they're outliers, and their experience will be an outlier experience by definition. <laughs> that's a, that's absolutely right, um, and and the same goes for you too. I mean, those are unique uh, economic models that can only be uh, facilitated by those types of artists. Yeah, they don't speak for the entire holistic music community at all. Um, they don't live in the reality of the everyday musician, certainly not the Bob Moulds of the world. Um, um, so I uh, fully, fully agree. And as far as me downloading an app to go get an album, I mean, I just, I mean, if we were talking about things that cost hundreds of dollars, you know, right. we're talking about, you know, $10 here or $3 or whatever the, whatever the cost is. Most people have recurring credit card charges on their credit card for those amounts. They don't even know what they are. They're just from subscriptions from like LinkedIn that they never even canceled. I mean, we're talking about an insignificant amount of money here that we're arguing over. It's like, look, somebody's just going to figure it out. There's gonna, there's an economic break point where it all makes sense. It doesn't. There's going to be an, just like Napster, just like everything else. The price had to come down to a point where it was just ridiculous to try to steal. The the the, the liability of stealing music didn't offset the stipend that you had to pay to get everything available to you. So that's that that was the inflection point. Yeah. I think we, you know, where where is that inflection point now? I don't know. Somewhere between a buck and ten dollars, right? Just tell me what it costs. Give me everything. Make it sound decent. If I want to listen to albums, I'll go listen to albums. But again, I mean, I think there's a lot of, there's more money spent on figuring out why than, than, than figuring out how. I mean, it's really like this whole kind of pontificating on like, what is it? Where is it? How does it deliver? Uh, what's the integrity behind it? I mean, we're just talking about music here, yeah. you know? How much does it cost and where can I get it? And I think uh, Brian's absolutely right. You don't, you know, it took a long time before people bought their cigarettes at a gas station, you know, and I, I, I don't smoke anymore, but I mean, I can see people buying cigarettes and like, okay, that's an evolutionary process. You're not going to go somewhere that you don't normally go. You're not going to go to, you know, Walgreens to buy uh, CDs. It just doesn't happen. It's a, it's a learned behavior. You're going to go to where you, to where you get music from. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I'm cursing myself now because I should have made a segue earlier when I was talking about cars, but uh, uh, Uber announced a partnership with Spotify this week, uh, which uh, uh, to me sounds like the, you know, a, a way to solve uh, the most uh, uh, pointless first world problem ever, uh, which, is <laughs> which is to <laughs> have your uh, favorite music playing when you jump into your Uber car uh, and uh, you are taken to your destination. So, uh, you know, this is it, essentially, you know, users are going to be able to <laughs> log into the Spotify account on the app. Uh, drivers will also be connected and uh, uh, select cars, the cars that choose to uh, join the program uh, will be able to play music uh, of your choice when you get onto the vehicle. So uh, I'm, I'm sure the drivers are going to love that at 2 o'clock in the morning when there's uh, uh, really drunk people that are boarding their cars and uh, play God knows what. Uh, I don't think there's much to comment on this. Anybody wants to venture anything on, on this story? <laughs> yeah, I, w I will. I will say that I hope that, that Uber goes out of business. Um, you know, they're 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 a predatory company that preys off of their drivers. They have uh, higher level executives that are anti women. They have known dirty tricks against their competitors, and while their competitors like Lyft offer a very, very similar service uh, at, a, at a similar price point, there's no compelling u reason for any evolved person to use a service which is so evil and which is, you know, by all, uh, by all lights going to win. But, you know, just, just to use it because it's become the default and to use it because it's got momentum and traction. Um, you know, you're supporting the bad guys, and I think you should stay away from them. Right. I'm guilty of that, is that yesterday. A, is that a direct message to Daniel Eck? 
<laughs> uh, well, for Spotify, I mean, look, just this whole integration between Spotify and Uber is yet another testament to the incredible decadence uh, that is uh, that is San Francisco today, and that will be written about a hundred years from now as some sort of gilded age, and they're going to make movies about it or whatever the media of the future would be. And people are going to accuse them of caricaturing it, but it won't even be close to how depraved that city is today. Ooh, nice. yeah, the digital Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> I love having Brian on the show. It's great. And, <laughs> I, no, I, I mean, I, I, I'm I not going to touch that one. That was yeah, great, Brian. That was Thanks. great, Brian. Uh, that was uh, that was a uh, uh, fantastic. And uh, you know, it's it's difficult in London. I, I'm really hoping there's going to be an alternative come up uh, very very soon. Uh, I was in a pinch yesterday and I had about 10 minutes to get somewhere, and so I uh, guilty as charged. I use Uber, uh, but I I stand with you, uh, Brian, on some of the comments around uh, drivers because uh, I paid five pounds for. Uh, 13 14 minute drive that would cost me probably about 10 to 12 13 on a black app and i'm just kind of wondering how much a driver actually gets out of that so uh, that does make me feel pretty guilty about using it so uh, yeah I i'm with you on that and uh, finally uh, before we go uh, a couple of things that we uh, kind of skipped because they're not that consequential but uh, uh, uh rio Karev, the uh, ceo of uh, uh, vivo has announced uh, stepping down at the end of the year uh, and they also announced that they paid uh, vivo announced that they paid over 500 million dollars to uh, music rights holders uh, uh, since 2010 but when you read uh, that they are on track to deliver a uh, hundred billion billion streams uh, uh, annually that actually doesn't seem like uh, that big of an amount and it's half what uh, uh, Spotify has paid out to rights holder just this year because uh, uh, they paid out around a billion uh, um, to rights holder this uh, this year alone so uh, interesting story there but uh, yeah not not a huge amount to comment on and uh, uh, after that uh, SFX earnings uh, uh, you know they missed uh, expectations again and the stock took a battering. It's at the lowest point ever uh, since uh, uh, starting. Uh, they, they went from $12, I think, to three seventy dollars now, uh, the stock. So it's not good since the IPO, and we'll see what happens there. Uh, you, you know, do you think that, uh, Jim, do you think there's a future for, for companies that are just so hell-bent on, on being in one vertical? and, and or, or is it too risky to, to just uh, chance it on EDM and just be the EDM player? Well, again, you know, I think it's I think it's always risky to bet on culture and and cultural significance as a as a uh, as a commodity. Um, but again, you know, I mean, I don't know that much about it. You know, I don't yeah. I know you know I don't know uh, much about SFX's business model or what they've got up their sleeve for the future. But again, you know, I think you know music is a very cyclical business, and I think betting on it uh, in any way, shape, or form as a as a form of economics is always wrong. And the thing that really makes up the music business are people that love to make music. Yeah. And you know, once you start once you start tacking on economic models to art, it always becomes a dangerous uh, a dangerous game to play. Usually with the gun pointed the wrong way. Right. And uh, that's that's pretty much that, uh, I, I, unless I've missed anything. But uh, no, I think we covered all the key points for this week. Of course, there's more stories going on around the Taylor Swift thing. And uh, uh, I mean, I'm not going to bore my listeners too much longer with that. But uh, Sony Music uh, is uh, uh, reportedly the ch uh, CFO of Sony Music in uh, Tok uh, the Tokyo press conference. Uh, uh, Kevin uh, Kelleher uh, uh, stated that the company is considering the role of streaming uh, uh, as part of the organization. They are very encouraged by the paid streaming model but the key question for them is whether or not the free ad supported services are taken away uh, from how quickly and to what extent we can grow those paid services that's the million dollar question that everybody is asking so he didn't add anything of substance here and uh, uh, I don't know uh, I'm sure you know guys you have your own views around uh, uh, the uh, whole Taylor Swift story and now you've expressed them to, to some extent during the show uh, as, as a closing note uh, you know do, do you feel like uh, uh, this is a trend that's going to continue and it's going to create real problems for services like Spotify if they continue to have big albums that are missing from, from their service or is it just a, a transitional period and that's going to pass and, and people are just going get to on, get on the bandwagon? Um, you know, I just, I think it was just a numbers game for Taylor Swift and it's just, you know, she just ran the numbers and, and yeah. that was really the, the answer to her question. I don't think it really translates to any of the other artists on Spotify or the business plan in general. Right, right. No, because, you know, I, I looked up last week and uh, I think it was last week or, ten, or two weeks ago and it looked like five or six of the top ten uh, Billboard 200 albums were not on Spotify. So it just started to look like a bit of a, of a trend, essentially. 
Well, I mean, people like Adele are pro-streaming, but they want to preserve some sort of windowing to, in order yeah. to try and get some revenue from download sales. And I think that ultimately, the value prop for a consumer to download and keep anything in a permanent form in their device is sort of silly. It seems artificial to me. So the real challenge will be is how do... Um, how, how can the streaming services get enough adoption and have a justifiable enough economic model so that way artists can make a sustainable living? And I know that it's a terrible challenge for Adele and Taylor Swift to make a sustainable living, and I really wish them all the best in their careers. <laughs> yeah, I, I would love it. Can you imagine if Apple came up with the idea of having a, a service where if you Google, if, if you search for Google, if you search for the Taylor Swift album on, on their service, it just came up with a pop-up and said, if you pay $3 extra, you can access the Taylor Swift album for the next six months, and, and nobody else can. Uh, that would be interesting, right? Yeah, I mean, that would be cool. Or you could do what Amazon would do, which would say, oh, we don't carry it, but buy this thing instead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that happened a lot during the Hachette uh, crisis. Uh, and uh, I yeah. still haven't read the Amanda Palmer book. I feel pretty bad, but I really have to get onto it. Everybody says that it's amazing. I don't know if you guys have uh, are planning to read it or not. I'm not ready yet. Uh, yeah, still working my way through the yeah, Peter yeah. Thiel book. Right. No, I haven't got that either. Yeah. Too much reading to do. It's, it's uh, yeah, it's pretty overwhelming. Uh, and that's it. Uh, well, guys, it was uh, such a pleasure having you on. And uh, Jimmy, uh, of course, uh, Live One, uh, if you go on uh, Live One, is it liveoneinc.com? Sorry, I haven't got the URL here. That's right. Live One. I think it's liveonegroup.com. Liveonegroup.com. Yeah, go yeah. check it out because uh, they're doing some pretty awesome stuff. And uh, uh, you can also watch some uh, really great uh, bands uh, play live, which is uh, not a bad thing. And uh, also events if you are uh, into that. And uh, uh, Brian, uh, for you, it's adrav.com? Uh, no. Dot net. Dot net. Adrav right, of course, yeah. Uh, adrav.net. Uh, uh, go and check it out. Uh, and uh, any, uh, I don't know if you guys have any personal project that you want to plug uh, at all on top of that. All good? No? Cool. Perfect. I just, Not at the moment. Thank you. I just always ask in case uh, anybody's got an album coming out or something. Uh, uh, well, it was such a pleasure having you on. And thanks so much for listening to DMT this week. Uh, the show comes out every week. You can find it on digitalmusictrends.com. And also this week, the DMT one-to-one -one is back on after a couple of weeks break uh, due to other commitments. But uh, I've got the CEO of 7Digital that talks uh, to us about uh, the company and uh, uh, the uh, recent merger and everything else. So that's quite a cool, uh, interesting interview. Thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week. And until next time.